Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about the connection between the various different thermodynamic ensembles that we have introduced. In other words, I'm going to explain how we can calculate the partition function for the isothermal isobaric ensemble, for the partition function, for the canonical ensemble, and so on. As always, though, before we start on that, let's first briefly recap the ideas that have been introduced in other videos. So remember, first of all, that before we started on any of these ensembles, we introduced the notion of the generalised partition function. I explained how we can find the probability of being in any given microstate, J, by minimising the information functional subject to, two to some constraints. There are two types of constraint that we can introduce. The first of these types is a constraint on the value of the extensive thermodynamic variables. We say that a microstate is only allowed if it has a particular value for the extensive variable interest. So, for example, we might state that a microstate is only allowed if the number of atoms in that microstate is equal to n. Any microstate that has more or less atoms than n is then said to be inaccessible. The second type of constraint is on the average values of the extensive thermodynamic variables that are not constrained in the first way. I show that these constraints on the average values of the extensive variables could be incorporated by using Lagrange multiples and by doing a constrained optimization of the information functional. This whole procedure led us to the following expression for the probability of being in the accessible microstate J. Furthermore, through this procedure, we also generalized the, defined the generalized partition function as shown here. We then discussed how we can arrive at the various different ensembles that we have in statistical thermodynamics by changing the set of extensive variables that are constrained to have a particular value. We said in particular that the canonical ensemble comes about if you explicitly fix the number of atoms and the volume of the system. There is a constraint that the average energy is finite, and the temperature then drops out in the Lagrange multiplier. The partition function for the canonical ensemble is given by the following expression. In the isothermal isobaric ensemble, you fix the number of atoms. There are constraints on the average value of the volume and the average value of the energy, and these are introduced through Lagrange multipliers, which turn out to be related to the pressure and temperature. The partition function for the isothermal isobaric ensemble is shown here. During class, you derived a formula for the grand canonical ensemble. We said that in this ensemble, only the volume is fixed, there are constraints on the average value of the number of atoms and the average value of the energy, and these introduce Lagrange multipliers that turn out to be related to the chemical potential and the temperature. The grand canonical partition function turns out to be equal to the following. In this video, the first new thing that I want to introduce is the way that we calculate these partition functions if we have a continuous state space. In essence, the in the continuous limits, summations are replaced by integral signs, and we thus have that the partition functions are given by the following integrals. Now, this rather glib statement glosses over a lot of interesting mathematics, but is the sort of things that you will find in physics papers on this subject. The problem here is that if we try to be too formal, we end up writing out a lot of mathematical symbols, and the equations start to look horrendous. Furthermore, physics papers are written for other physicists who know statistical mechanics and who know what we mean by these integrals. It is thus reasonably safe to do slapdash stuff such as this. This video is not for fully trained physicists who know statistical mechanics, however. It is for students, so we are going to try and be a bit careful in what we write. So, in doing this, we are going to start from the partition function for the microcanonical ensemble. In the microcanonical ensemble, the number of atoms, the volume, and the energy are all fixed. We thus know 
that only those microstates with number of atoms n, volume v, and energy e will be accessible. Furthermore, from the principle of equal a priori probabilities, we know that the probabilities of being in all these accessible microstates will all be equal. If we have a discrete state space, we can thus write the microcanonical partition function as shown here. Here, the sum runs over all possible microstates, and the function delta is only equal to 1 if its argument is equal to 0. This summation is thus simply counting the number of microstates that have number of atoms n, volume v, and energy e. Let's now consider how we would write out this expression for the microcanonical partition function if the state space is continuous. We essentially have to calculate the following multiple interval. We integrate over every position and every momentum coordinate of the system, every degree of freedom. Hence, if we have a system of n atoms, we are calculating a 6n dimensional integral, an integral over three position and three momentum coordinates for each of the atoms in our system. Inside this integral, we have our delta functions once again, so only those microstates that have energy E, number of atoms N, and volume V make any contribution to the final value of the partition function. Let's now see how we can write out the integrals for the canonical, isothermal, isobaric, and grand canonical partition functions for a system that has a continuous state space in a way that is less displeasing. At heart, we do this by looking over the partition functions we wrote for a system with a discrete phase space. For the canonical partition function, this was a sum over all the microstates that had volume V and number of atoms N. Thinking of this with the multiple integrals above, we could thus replace the delta function acting on h of x and p minus e in the integral at the top of this slide for the microcanonical partition function with an e to the minus beta h of x, the term from inside this sum for the canonical partition function. We can do this even more neatly, however, by writing the canonical partition function as an integral with the microcanonical partition function inside it, as shown here. Let's now consider the isothermal isobaric ensemble. For systems with a discrete phase space, the partition function for this ensemble is as shown here. It thus stands to reason that this can be written as the following integral over the volume with the canonical partition function acting with the canonical partition function inside it. Let's lastly consider the grand canonical partition function, which for a system with a discrete phase space is given by the sum shown here. For a system with a continuous phase space, we can rewrite this as the interval shown at the bottom of the slide. These integrals that connect the partition functions are very useful. There is, however, another even more useful trick that we can introduce once we understand the basis of this idea. This is the notion of an order parameter. We introduce order parameters to describe how far a chemical reaction has progressed. Here, our order parameter is given the symbol zeta. To be clear, this is simply some function of the atomic positions. If we use this, we can calculate a value of the microcanonical partition function if the order parameter is fixed at some particular value. As shown here, this is simply a matter of introducing one additional delta function into our multidimensional integral, as shown here. Remember, the integral for the microcanonical partition function shown here, just in a manner of speaking, k 
counts the number of microstates that have these particular values for the quantities in the delta functions inside the integrals. In other words, this integral here is simply counting the number of microstates that have a volume equal to V, an energy equal to E, and an order parameter value equal to zeta. We can now integrate the microcanonical partition function over the energy and can thus arrive at the following formula for the canonical partition function. Notice, however, that this is the canonical partition function when the order parameter zeta is fixed at a particular value. Our next step is to take the logarithm of this partition function and to multiply this quantity by kBt. This gives us the free energy for having a particular zeta value. We can thus get a free energy profile as a function of the order parameter and get some ideas of the barrier to the reaction and the free energies of the various intermediate states that might form along the reaction pathway. Here I show an example of one of these free energy profiles. This profile was calculated by a colleague of mine, Davide Branduardi, from a computer simulation. The simulation was looking at a nucleophilic substitution reaction for a haloalkane. In essence, during the reaction, the green chlorine atom that is attached to the light blue carbon atom is replaced by a second chlorine atom. Davide used here the distance between the blue carbon atoms and one of the chlorine atoms as an order parameter in his simulation. We thus see a peak in the free energy profile indicating that there is no intermediate for the reaction. The reaction mechanism is, the, is SN2 in accordance with what is observed in experiment. These details are unimportant though. What it is important to realise is that this technique that I have shown here, this form of integration essentially, is what allows us to make connections between the results from simulation and theory and the results from experiments. The free energy is something that experimentalists can measure, so we can thus use simulations such as these ones to test our models for the interaction between atoms and to investigate the mechanisms by which reactions to take, take place. This is the basis of some of the simulations that go on here in the ASC at Queen's. Hence, if you can understand the statistical mechanics that we have done in this course, you are in a position to start doing research just like this. There is only a little tiny bit more to it. If you have understood all the ideas I have presented here though, then you have understood all the hardest parts. Congratulations and thank you for your attention.